Hey everyone. Uh, I must say I'm a bit surprised uh, by myself that I'm giving a talk at an Android conference about cross-platform development. Over the years, um, there have been many different cross-platform development solutions, but as a native engineer, I never felt that any of them came close to what we can build in either Android or iOS directly. React Native is one of the newer cross-platform solutions, and as the name hints, it renders using uh, native UI components. So to integrate it, you may also need native mobile engineering experience to make it work with your application, as well as to make it really fit well within your current infrastructure. But it unlocks potential for people on your team or within your company con to contribute to your mobile engineering efforts that previously weren't, particularly web engineers who may already have uh, experience with React. So today I'm going to share our journey with React Native at Pinterest how we have integrated it into both our existing mobile solutions and how we started using it for selective screens. So my name is Torben Priemke. I work at Pinterest as a product engineer. At Pinterest, we work to help people discover the things they love and inspire them to go do those things in their daily lives. In my three years at the company, I've worked on different parts of our Android application. Originally, I started working on Android back in 2011, and prior to that, on BlackBerry as well as Windows Mobile. So you can see I have a you know, long history with doing native development. And despite that, I still think React Native is a very good technology to consider for your product. First, I'm going to give um, a bit of a background about React Native, Re React Native as well as why uh, it was of uh, interest for us as Pinterest. And then I'm going to dive into some of the uh, technical integrations uh, that we had to do as well as uh, talk about the current state and where we uh, see it going for us. So React Native, um, most of you may already be familiar with it, but for those who are not, let me just highlight a few points. React Native was, is developed by Facebook, uh, similar to the React framework that people use for web. Initially, it came out for iOS and later for Android, but at this point, there, there are implementations for other platforms as well. There's even a flavor uh, React Native for web that lets you use the React Native components and render them in the uh, browser. So React Native is based on JavaScript, and you use React's JSX format to define your screens. It renders natively, so it provides that native experience that you're um, used to delivering to your users. But that also means that every component that you use in JavaScript a React Native component, is backed by a native implementation. And last is extensible, so that means that if you have that uh, specific uh, component that you want to build uh, on Android or iOS natively, or you already have it built and simply want to bring it over into the JavaScript world, you can bridge it. Similarly, if there's specific APIs, for example, you work with GPS and you need to have a pulling mechanism, you can actually implement that on the native sites and then expose it to the uh, JavaScript side. Now you may wonder why uh, we have an interest in uh, React Native at Pinterest, given that we already have pretty mature mobile apps um, on each of the clients. So for me, from a product engineering standpoint, uh, while I was working on the shopping team, I wanted to build uh, post-purchase surveys. These surveys um, you know, have a very simple UI but they may also change frequently or even dynamically. On the growth team, they wanted to use React Native in order to um, faster iterate on the onboarding flows as well as to um, work around the inconsistency in the different platforms that happen from when there's a small iteration on, let's say, iOS, but not Android or vice versa, by simply having one implementation. And from a business standpoint, React Native is very attractive because we already use React on the web, so we have lots of engineers that are already familiar with it and theoretically could contribute to our mobile applications. This is especially true for teams that may not be uh, fully staffed on the mobile side. And then also, uh, we're only looking to integrate it uh, piece by piece, you know, with selective screens, not looking to do a full rewrite. And so for that, um, it really worked for us. Primarily, we're looking um, to do screens in React Native that have a simple UI and uh, we can use our existing UI components for. So, and that are either uh, very frequently iterated on or rarely iterated on. For the frequently iterated case, 
we could theoretically even uh, leverage uh, something called a code push where you can update the JavaScript over the air so that when you, for example, have a winning iteration of your experiment, you can push it out to all the previous binaries. And for the really iterative screens, we're hoping that, you know, let's say that setting screen or uh, something else, uh, a surface that's not very often touched, by using React Native, we actually have that change go out to both platforms instead of one at a time. From the Android side, for me, there's the, the big benefit of not having to rebuild the native application. Um, at best, you know, 30 seconds for maybe a layout change, generally one to three minutes, sometimes even worse. So having something that basically instantly reloads um, is, is really uh, powerful. Um, the changes that you make in your IDE, as soon as you save, can be hot reloaded, and only the files um, that actually changed are then moved to the emulator and the screen is re-rendered. Um, this can be a problem if you, for example, have an uh, app with many different screens, but for us, we only work at one screen at a time, so when it reloads, it always reloads the screen that you're actually working on. Another aspect is context. So let's say you have a team, a vertical team, and you have your web engineer, iOS and Android. Um, those are three people, there's three different platforms, um, oftentimes, we make some minor tweaks during the implementation phase, or there's um, you know, assumptions being made maybe by one platform over the other. So having one engineer work on both the web as well as the mobile implementations, because we still have to write it twice, um, really cuts down on this communication uh, overhead, and you really only need to sync maybe with your PM or designer when making changes. So in theory, this should allow us to move faster as well as um, not having to go back and do um, you know, some cleanup work um, that happened due to the miscommunication or simply do those assumptions that were made by one platform over another. And something to consider here is that what, what are you starting with? What is your foundation? Uh, there's two terms, uh, greenfield and brownfield. Greenfield is an application that started brand new. So most of your React Native applications are Greenfield apps today, and from an Android standpoint, that would mean you have one activity with a React Native read view inside, and all your JavaScript or all your React Native screens running within. You can also think about uh, the metaphor from uh, you know, doing a new construction of a house versus doing an add-on to your existing. So the brownfield is an existing application like the Pinterest one, where we all want to integrate it. And here are many different factors uh, that you wouldn't encounter normally in a greenfield application. And I'll go into more detail on those uh, during the technical part. Um, it's similar to um, if you would start a new Android application today, you have the choice of using Java or Kotlin. Um, but there's also many applications out in the wild that have adopted a Kotlin partially, so they're integrating Kotlin into their brownfield app. For a brownfield app, you generally have uh, one activity or one fragment mapped to one modular screen on the um, React Native side, simply because you can uh, go often back and forth between the Native and the React Native side. And I'll also touch on that more later. So now, after hearing all my points, you might say, you know, but is there, is there no other way? And sure, maybe we could build something where we have some custom format that's uh, sent, some custom uh, data format that's sent down from the API and then rendered on each client. You again would have to implement the client-side rendering on two platforms, though. Um, this was actually you know, experimented with at a uh, team at Pinterest, but uh, later didn't ship. And I think uh, using React Native, we actually have more flexibility. We could actually build a system like that later on, on top of the React Native layer, and you know, your dynamic UI would be sent out from the server, but you would only have to build the UI part once, and it would work on both iOS and Android. Could you maybe also just hire more mobile engineers and fix those resource uh, constraint teams? Sure, you could do that as well, but you know, maybe that's not too scalable. And then we already have all that talent in the company that knows React, and we could leverage right away rather than having to you know, build up the hiring platform. And lastly, doesn't it really add a lot more complexity to your infrastructure? And that's uh, one of the key points that we really um, 
you know, try to make as easy and frictionless as possible, both from the native engineers as well as direct native engineers. So very few people actually have to touch those uh, new pieces in the infrastructure. And we also decided not to build them all at once, but rather uh, do this in an iterative process. As we see things missing, we build them um, and not let React Native work start that maybe needs something that's currently not there. And I'll explain more on that later as well. So how many people work on this at Pinterest? Um, it started with the three of us as the core team. Uh, Michael, he works in the core experience team. Um, he built things like the event bridge, which allows us to communicate between React Native and Native and React Native, um, as well as the navigation and some other foundational pieces. Vivian from the growth team, she built the original prototype uh, integration for iOS, and myself, I did the Android part. So now that I've covered some of the basics and why we wanted to explore React Native, I'm going through the technical aspects of the integration. Um, and hopefully you find those interesting, um, especially if you're looking to integrate React Native into your Brownfield app. So first, you know, the new code, the new React Native code that you're going to write is going to be JavaScript. And for our setup, we have uh, the Android code base and the iOS code base. They're different um, repositories. Now we need the shared code to somehow fit in there. Um, this is already a difference for most, for compared to a Greenfield application, where generally you have one repository in which both of your projects live together with the shared uh, JavaScript code. For us, in the end, we decided to go with a separate third repository to keep the JavaScript code in. This third repository would only have to be actually you know, pulled down to your machine for those that work on React Native. The native engineers that work on either Android or iOS would never have to touch this. We made sure that that was you know, frictionless. However, for building the JS bundle, which is what you have to do to package up all your JavaScript files and to ship with you know, your binary to the App Store, um, the React Native folder needs to be part of the folder structure of your application. So for that, uh, we decided to use uh, symbolic linking at the time of bundling and then remove the link afterwards. So again, this is a very small uh, only layout that touches um, the current infrastructure. So and on top of that, the JavaScript bundles, we check them in to each of their uh, respective native repositories so that if an engineer works on the application and stumbles upon a screen that's actually built in React Native, it still loads. Um, it doesn't show an error because it just falls back on that bundle that's already in the repository. The second piece, you know, React Native has that native aspect. So there are uh, the native com uh, dependencies uh, first of all, there's the one from React Native itself and then from any of the libraries that you may use. In a Greenfield application, you normally would uh, link those in from the Nodes Modules folder. So that's something that, you know, in your Rea React Native uh, project, there's a description of all your dependencies. You do an NPM or Yarn install and it pulls down all those dependencies. And the normal setup is that you go to your settings.gradle and you put a reference to where that native code actually lives. Now, that would require the native engineers to actually go through the step, and that's something we wanted to avoid. So uh, we looked at you know, how does Facebook do this as far as like packaging React Native, because they don't require you to put this entry into settings or Gradle. So they actually packaged their dependency as a Maven a package. So we simply did the same with like, our React Native event bridge. And, um, Whichever uh, specific version we use, we copy it over into the native repository. So it's always checked in there, and you can always build the Android or iOS app without uh, having to you know, know anything about React Native. So what does that look like? So for the native, um, for the event bridge, you would have to set up uh, your definition for that Maven package, and then we have a, a Gradle command that lets you execute and build those. And we actually push those out uh, even to NPM, so anybody else uh, using um, the React Native event bridge would get the, the same packaging in case they're building a similar Brownfield app like us. It's already there provided for them. Another uh, thing that comes up often is, you know, but what about my APK size? What about my method count? So for us, uh, we had already gone through the step of actually going to a split APK for by architecture uh, when we um, used some other uh, third-party library that came with native dependencies in order to reduce our APK size. Uh, 
So that was already done for us, so we didn't really have to do more on that part. As far as multi-dexing, we were already above one dex, and we didn't, we can't really go back down to one. It's just not possible. So, uh, you know, we still did the pro guarding thing, but it adds around 10,000 methods um, to your dex. So that's quite significant, but we were already at a multi-dex situation, so that was okay. At the same time as we were evaluating React Native, um, there was a different team already trying out Fresco, which is Facebook's image library that's packaged with React Native. Um, so this was already in our code base, therefore our impact on the APK increase um, per architecture was only about two megabytes. If Fresco was not in it, it would actually have been three megabytes. So that's a significant increase. Um, I believe we were around 10 before, so 13 afterwards. That's quite the increase. And then the other piece to consider is that React Native currently only ships with 32-bit native libraries. Um, I believe there's work, and that should be fixed soon, but it's due to the JS core only being available in 32-bit. Um, so I mentioned that the multi dex or the method count increase is not that significant or not that big of a deal, but the app size is. So we actually shipped one version uh, to the App Store, uh, maybe even two, that actually only included the new React Native dependencies, and we uh, did analysis on the download numbers to make sure that those did not decrease, uh, either stayed the same or increased um, due to the additional uh, package size. And from that evaluation, it showed that there was not any significant impact, and so that was part of the evaluation and part of the decision to actually go ahead. Let's look at how we actually render the different screens. So uh, our application is set up with one activity and many fragments. You know, there's a few other activities, but generally the app runs within one giant activity with a bunch of different fragments. So when we think about the different React Native screens in that case, we actually map one uh, React Native component or module to one fragment. This was, works also well with our navigation stack, which I'll talk about in a minute. minute. So here we'll see an example, the business sign-up component, and I removed pretty much all the content from within so it fits on the slide. Um, but this uh, one component maps to one fragment. So on the native side, we set up a little bit of plumbing for the screen. Um, but the important piece is the module name, which is referenced uh, as business sign-up. And then in order to have some logic that talks in between the native and uh, the React Native and the native part for completing this particular flow, there's some event handling. You may also notice there's a base method, React uh, Native Base Fragment. So we have already abstracted away some of the things like um, that you can provide some initial um, properties, something like similar to intent Android extras. Uh, on Android for activities, and you only need to override the specific methods that you need for your particular screen. So it's very lightweight. Um, all the heavy lifting is, uh, is uh, already done for those engineers that may not have that much experience on the mobile side, but still need to set up this piece on the native side. So then one, one big thing is when you come from, let's say, either uh, Java or Kotlin, is that you're going from a statically uh, typed language to a dynamic one. Um, that was something that you know, it would feel really weird to probably most native engineers. Um, on our website, uh, or on our uh, web infrastructure, we were already using flow typing. So there's two different typing packages that are pretty popular, either flow or TypeScript. Um, so we decided to go with flow on the React Native side as well, just simply because there was already the familiarity around the company with this particular um, library. What it provides for you is that, you know, um, all your data structures, um, all your um, methods can be annotated with particular types. So this helps either for type ahead and the IDE, as well as for things like refactoring um, that you, you know, very much familiar with Android Studio, you, you know, whatever the shortcut is, and boom, you change the name and it updates everywhere. With typing, we can have that same functionality in JavaScript as well. Um, and for us, uh, every component is 100% flow typed. Uh, we ensure that during the code review. So if somebody is not familiar that writes a new screen, we'll let them know that they also need to add the typing. So how does the interaction between a native and React Native actually work? Um, so there's the JavaScript core, which uh, processes all your screens. Um, there's the bridge, the communication between React Native and Native. And this bridge actually needs to be initialized. So 
For a Greenfield app, when it starts up, you might see like a flash screen. That's part to hide that initialization before the actual screen would load. So you don't actually end up with a white screen while the JS engine is spread up while the uh, bridge is uh, initialized. So for us, we initialize this bridge um, after the cold step of the application finished so that if you navigate to any of the React Native screens, uh, there should almost be no uh, delay. Now I'll get into some of the pieces um, that we had to bring over from the native side, from both iOS and Android, and expose them to the JavaScript side. So our API client, you know, there's many things that you might have already have uh, in your API client, like um, handling um, your access token, renewing the token, certain logging, maybe um, certain, um, like for reducing the bandwidth consumption on certain networks or users. And so we didn't want to re-implement all those things on the JavaScript side. So for this, there's something called bridging. Bridging is uh, what you can do with any of the native code to bring it over to the um, JavaScript side. And here, um, we bridge the API client so that we have the same functionality available on the JS side as we normally would on the native side. Here we look at the bridge uh, for the API client on the native side. Um, the important piece is here, the name, which is how it's exposed on the uh, JavaScript side. And then you can add a number of methods below. So in this case, the get path is simply a get request um, on the API. And if we look on the JS side, we see that we reference the native modules dot, uh, pi react native Pinterest client. And then below, the actual implementation in the JavaScript side that references this call to the native side. Um, obviously, this is only one method. We have a few more to basically cover all the rest cases. The next piece is, at Pinterest, we have a design system. So it makes it very easy to implement a new screen, because ideally, you can leverage uh, UI components already built and very standardized. That's good for the build time, as well as like you don't have any like uh, problems as far as going from a pixel-perfect design to a pixel-perfect implementation, because those components should already be up to par. Instead of bridging all these UI components over from the native side, we actually decided to mimic what was already available on the web. On the web, we have this design system implemented under the name Gestalt. And you know, all the web engineers are very much familiar. We decided, though, instead of using something like uh, React Native Web, where we could actually share the underlying implementation, to port it over but preserve the API so that uh, all the web engineers avail uh, familiar with the API of Gestalt could use the same components, uh, same React Native components, without having to really relearn anything. So this covers most of the cases. So I mentioned at the beginning that you know, we're looking to use uh, React Native for screens that have a you know, pretty straightforward UI. Um, and those screens can be implemented using Gestalt or using these core components. Another piece that where we actually brought over the native implementation of um, a UI components is our image view. The reason for that is that um, we already have a pretty co uh, robust component on both platforms to handle our image loading. and um, so on the Android side, that's Picasso. I mentioned earlier we were already looking at Fresco, but it wasn't the one that we were actually using for the majority of the app at the time. And the other key component here is that um, if you use Fresco on the Android side um, on React Native, and for example, Picasso on the native side, you actually would actually have two different caches for your images. So when you're you know, thinking maybe about an avatar being loaded on the native side, and then you re-render it on the React Native side, it's best if that comes from the same cache, um, simply for the speed as well as not increasing the, the memory overhead for your application. So that's the reason we expose the um, native image views from both platforms to the React Native side. Navigation, I briefly touched on it earlier when I was explaining how we're using uh, one module to one fragment for the mapping. So from navigation from a native screen to a React Native one, it's very straightforward, um, as those fragments are simply registered in our no normal uh, navigation framework. So that's already taken care of. But then 
we also maybe want to preserve things like gestures that are available on iOS or anything specific uh, as far as the navigation works that we have on the native side. So we decided not to use any of the JavaScript uh, navigation, but fully rely on our native uh, navigation stack. Um, so that means if we have a flow of screens on the uh, React Native side, we actually go through the native layer each time. So we have a router component that has, in this case, a method called push, which pushes a new screen onto the stack. So if you're on the React Native side, you can call a router, say push, and you can either provide something what we call a deep link, some similar to what you would have um, for like a push notification intent, um, that we have our own system for handling, or you can provide another um, module, uh, another React Native module as the path. And then a payload that can be passed onto the next screen, such as I want to uh, navigate to a detailed screen, so I need to pass an ID along. Then on the native side, we actually you know, handle this particular push request. We try to first handle it as, as that deep link. If not, then we fall back and simply load a uh, React Native container Load that, um, load that module and pass along any extras that came with the payload. So for us, um, this has worked really well. Um, it, it keeps things really simple on um, the React Native side because you're building one component that has very little state and um, uh, it's, it's, it's built you know, much in isolation rather than having a really large component that has its own navigation within, and then you're running into problems potentially between the navigation on the native side and the React native side if you try to handle that. So for us, um, going through the native side to actually push another screen uh, is worth that extra step. Localization is something that, you know, obviously our app has being published in many different countries, but initially we didn't have this built in on the React native side. <laughs> We were actually uh, putting the strings in both Android and iOS, then putting them when we actually display the React Native screen through the initial properties. And that's not something that would have scaled, and you know, that's some of the friction that we're trying to avoid when people try out React Native. So we looked at the different libraries that are uh, available for JavaScript, and the ones we looked at all prefer to stick to strings inside whatever your um, screen is. and so. You know, that's very different from how you maybe think about string resources uh, on Android. So um, while we leverage uh, one of the JS libraries for actually mapping the different languages, uh, we build a little um, piece of infrastructure that mimics very much how strings work on Android. So you would define a new string uh, with, a with an ID, uh, the string itself, and a node. The node is always there for the translator, so they have context when they need to translate a new string. We then, for typing purposes, uh, generate the string maps automatically behind the scenes every time the strings file is saved. That allows for those strings then actually to show up in the type ahead in VS Code and make it very easy to reference them. Um, from um, an integration standpoint, uh, the strings uh, get automatically sent to the translation service and come back, and we lint on the way back to ensure that any placeholders um, are correct uh, compared to the original string. We currently don't have any linting in place for the usages, so theoretically you could use a string and not pass the uh, required uh, parameters. That's something the libraries offer, but due to you know, our system, uh, we don't have this piece um, just done yet. So I talked a lot about the bridging, and you know this is something that you probably uh, come across a lot when uh, working or when integrating React Native into a Brownfield app, because you want to bring uh, those existing frameworks. So two of them are that we also bridge over context logging and experiment framework over from the native side to the React Native side, because there's no, really no need to re-implement them. There's probably only a few methods for each of them that you want to expose over, and the real advantage is that when you know, any of these frameworks on the native side get actually improved, you will then get these improvements for free rather than, again, uh, ending up with fragmentation between this fragmentation that we're trying to solve between iOS and Android from a UI standpoint that happens between the native and the React Native or JavaScript implementation in these frameworks. So that's why uh, we chose to also bridge over uh, different frameworks. 
So now that I touched on some of the core pieces that we had to do from an infrastructure standpoint to make it really easy to use, let's look at how we're currently using it and um, the things that from a technical side we want to uh, work on. So from the beginning, we wanted to set us up for success and wanted to make sure that it's actually the right technology. So during the evaluation, which happened in the second half of last year, we first um, you know, got the, kind of the core of the infrastructure done as far as being able to integrate with both applications, with both platforms. And then um, the next screen, which is where you um, select, where you select uh, the topics that you're interested in as a new user, we re-implemented re it in React Native and then ran AA, ex AA experiments on both Android and iOS to verify that the performance of the native implementation is the same as the React Native one. And actually, a funny um, story from that is that we had to put platform-specific logic inside the React Native code in order to account for differences in the original native implementations. So you know that shows you there were some small differences, but we wanted to make sure we have actual AA um, comparisons in the experiment. So our dashboard showed that um, despite you know sometimes React Native being mentioned as there are some performance problems or things like that, we didn't encounter those in our isolated testing just from a performance standpoint, but also the dashboard showed that both screens or both implementation actually performed the same. Then as far as like um, getting new teams to use it, so after the evaluation ended and now we're in the phase where we actually want to try it out more broadly, um, we now meet with teams before they actually want to use the technology to make sure that we have everything in place for them. That involves looking at the designs and any other technical requirements they may, they may have to ensure that everything is there for them to go from start to finish without hitting any roadblock in between. There have been projects where something wasn't there and we just told them, hey, can you wait two weeks? We'll get that piece of the infrastructure done and then you have a much better time using React Native. So that goes with you know, both the native engineers should have, you know, no friction as far as React Native being intrused and the React Native customers should have no friction as far as like missing something from the native side. So thus far we have about like four -ish screens that are implemented. The, the next pick I just showed on the previous screen. Uh, the business sign up, which is where you convert a personal account to a business account, is one of those screens that, you know, gets implemented once and then um, probably doesn't get changed much often. Uh, there's a password recovery flow, as well as a pin reporting flow, which is how you send us feedback about a piece, piece of content in Pinterest. Um, then, you know, through these own projects, we keep improving the foundation, and hopefully, you know, more and more engineers will adopt it. Um, some technical work that we're currently looking at doing. So I mentioned uh, you know, the screens, they're all full screen, so currently we can't embed just a piece of React Native, a React uh, root view that has a variable height uh, because the communication with JS is asynchronous. So at the time that we do the measure or the layout on the native side, we may not actually know the layout on the JS side may have not have happened. So therefore, we don't know the exact size. On iOS, there's already support for this. So we're looking to add this on the Android side to also let teams uh, use a new React Native screen within the existing full screen. And if any of you have read the latest update on the state of React Native, uh, they mentioned that they're also doing a re-architecture which um, adds more synchronous support. And then at the beginning, I mentioned that uh, for the growth team, they may be interested again uh, pushing new updates of the JS bundle over the air. And so that is something that we initially considered, but then decided it wasn't critical for the uh, initial tries. But uh, we're looking to add support for that now. So thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you learned something. And maybe your native experience on Android can really help your team to also bring this into your Brownfield application. Thanks.